Well, we're trekking through John. We're up to John chapter 6. Tonight, we'll be looking at some of the claims of Jesus in John chapter 8. So I hope that you can come back at 5 or 5.15 and then be with us at, at 6 o'clock for our evening worship. In John 6 and verse 68, one of the most interesting questions was asked. And Jesus asked this because he had been giving some teaching. He had been giving some information that his disciples and apostles and followers desperately needed to hear. And then the question was asked, well, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I am convinced today that there are a lot of voices in our ear. There are a lot of voices in our head. And some of that's very garbled. While we were at camp this week, the phone rang, and the phone rang, and the phone rang. I'm talking about the camp phone. <laughs> and, and, and somebody would begin to say a few words to me, and then it would be all garbled, and you couldn't understand the voice. And they'd call back again, and, they, and they'd call five or six times. And I'm, I'm confident that lightning struck that line because it was all garbled, and you couldn't hear the voice. You know what I'm also sure about? There are a lot of voices like that in your head and in my head, and it's all garbled, and we really can't understand it. And that's what the apostles and disciples were really working with here in this passage. There are many paths to follow out there. We're told that by the world. There's the path of hedonism or pleasure. And in Ecclesiastes, if you read those 12 chapters and if you read that volume of material, it's a diary that he kept. And here's what the diary said. Grab and grab and grab and grab and try this and try that. And when you do, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. It's like trying to grab the wind and tell somebody, look, I got the wind in my hand. You want to see it? And we're constantly searching all of that pleasure. It's fun for a while, but then it fades away. Paul said it this way in Philippians 3.19. He says, they only mind earthly things. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul said this in verse 2. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. He says, don't look at things on the earth because you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you shall also appear with him in glory. That's a voice that a lot of people in the 21st century are listening to. That's why a lot of people today, even as we speak, they're out there on those ball fields, even some of those little children. How sad it is that a parent would sacrifice that short term for the long term. Number two, have you ever, have you ever heard this? Have you ever heard anybody say this? I've heard this my entire life. Well, I just want to be happy. What does it mean to be happy? We had a great class this morning in room eight. We talked about a word, and the word was peace. And I want to ask you today in your life if you have peace in your life. I mean, really. Think about all the voices, all the battles, all the conflicts that are going on in our world and all the voices that we're listening to and some of those garbled messages that we're hearing. Do you today, do you have peace? Peace. I mean, inside of you, that, that contentment that says, it is well with my soul. Is it? You, what, what does that mean? I just want to be happy. Solomon said as the end of his life in his trek for happiness, here's what he learned happiness was is to recognize that God is above us. That God is God and we are not. And so we respect, we reverence, we fear God, and we do it His way because we keep His commandments. For this becomes man's a double -L. This becomes man's all. At the end of verse 13, he says. So if you really want lasting happiness, now you can do some short-term th short things that are pretty fun for a while, 
but then it fades. But if you want some long-term happiness, you need to follow Solomon's advice here in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. The voice of materialism. And the voice of materialism is found in a parable that Jesus teaches in Matthew 12, or Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. And he said there was, a, there was a man, and he, he had a lot of property, and he had a lot of land. And the thing about this man was he had a lot of, he had a lot of stuff. And so what he decided to do was he says, you know what, that, that barn over there is not big enough, and I'm going to get that barn down, and I'm going to build a bigger barn so I could put more stuff in my barn. I, I want to ask anybody in this room, if this sounds familiar to anybody in the room, is your closet full? Is there any room in your attic? What about your garage? Is it so full that you can't get a vehicle in it? You know those storage units that you bought, are those full? And here's the question, when is enough enough? And, and according to Solomon in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10, he says, if you're not satisfied with this, you're not gonna be satisfied with that. And he says, is silver enough? And then you want gold, and then what's after gold? See, it never ends. The pursuit and the chase never stops. Somebody says, well, I'll just get a bigger one. How big do they make them? How big is it going to be before I'm really satisfied? You see, it'll never be enough because those things don't long-term satisfy us. But we listen to that voice. We listen to that voice. More, more, more. Religion. Somebody says, well, that's a strange thing to pop on a screen, religion. I'm going to tell you why. There is out there in our society those who preach health and wealth prosperity. And there are those who pray, P-R-E-Y, on, on some innocent good hearts. If you will take your checkbook, this speaker says, over the airwaves or on television or on the Internet, and you will send me $100 of seed money. Some way or another, that's going to come back to you. You ever listen to a guy by the name of Joel Osteen? You ever, you ever heard that name? He's in Houston, Texas, and he has a service on Saturday night and three services on Sunday. And there are about 12 to 14,000 people in each and every one of those services. If you've ever listened to him, he didn't say anything. As a matter of fact, he is mocked and ridiculed by the world for not saying anything from the Bible. And so that, that will not resonate in people's lives. Oh, they'll go there and they'll leave there and they'll say, man, I feel good about myself. And then before they get to their car, they're cussing. <laughs> and they're thinking about their next lie. And they're thinking about who they're going to steal from because it hasn't made a difference in their life. You can do all of that kind of stuff. You can have all the religion you want, and it's not going to satisfy you. The world just keeps beating on our faith. No, no wonder John, an older man, about 80, maybe 90 years old, said this, Love not the world, the system of the world, the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the, the eye that sees what it shouldn't see. He says, listen, watch this now. Here's the message. It's verse 17. The world as you and I know it is passing away. But those of us who are trying to do the will of God, that lives and abides forever and ever and ever. John 6, 68 and 69. To whom shall we go? Peter said, Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that your words are true. And your words are going to take us somewhere. Jesus is the one who can take us to the Father. You know, it might be this morning that you're experiencing sadness. To whom shall we go? It may be this morning that you're, you're experiencing sickness. To whom shall we go? It may be this morning that you're experiencing sorrow. 
to whom shall we go? It may be this morning that you're experiencing separation. To whom shall we go? It may be this morning that you're experiencing sin. To whom shall we go? I'm going to suggest to us that the answer to all those S's is the one big S, the Son of God. Would you say amen? amen. To whom shall we go? Peter says, to whom shall we go? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Eternal life. Look at the voices. Look at the paths. Look at the pleasure. Look at the hedonism. Look at the phrase happiness. What is happiness? Look at materialism. More, more, more. Look at religion. Health and wealth, prosperity. Ever listen to this guy? He never says anything. The world won't bring you happiness. But Jesus has the words of eternal life. Those words are permanent. Those words will stick to your ribs. Those words will last. All the other things, passing and fading away. John 6 and verse 68. You know, as we end our lesson today, I want to help us be reminded of one thing. This past week, there was a billionaire who was in a helicopter with his daughter, and that helicopter went down. Whose will those things be now that he can't use them anymore? He lost the most precious cargo he had in that helicopter, his soul and the soul of his daughter. Doesn't last. As we think about our lives today, the only thing that lasts is the soul that we have. The body it won't last, but your soul will. You know, it is my job. It is my responsibility. It is on me from this platform and this pulpit to say things, to prick our hearts, to direct us and to guide us and to think about the things that are going to last forever. And that's your soul. It's the only thing that will. You know, we spend five days teaching and molding and training a lot of young people's hearts and minds, and they were precious, wonderful, outstanding. And I hope that we just planted some seeds. That was our job, and I believe we did it. Now today, my job is to plant another kind of seed into the hearts of everybody in this room, everybody who came. Because whether we're a billionaire or we're a pauper, and I've had some of those funerals. I had a funeral one time in Frankfurt where the man had no kinfolk. They couldn't find him anywhere. So the undertaker called me on the phone and says, uh, Tom, he says, I know, I know you're a pretty good guy, and uh, I, I've got this body here that the University of Kentucky doesn't even want it for research. It's, it's full of gangrene. It's, he's had both legs amputated and both arms. I'm going to put him in a little box, and I'm going to put some cellophane around it. Will you help me put it in the ground? I did. I'm going to tell you something. It was slippery that day. And that crevice was six feet deep. And as I got down there near the edge of that thing, I nearly slipped into that hole. I saw a man, and I prayed over a man that didn't have a wife, a child, a friend, an enemy to pray over him. But you know what? He died just like the billionaire did in that helicopter crash. The only thing you and I have is our soul. Is your soul ready for eternity? To whom shall we go? I'm sad. I'm sick. I'm, I'm going to go to Jesus. Jesus.